Send engaged. What's up, everybody? We've got uh, Jimmy here on the mic and Mark, as usual. And across the table from us, Ruben Allison and Adam Maxwell. And in between us on the table is probably the most expensive table adornments ever on the podcast. We are going to be talking about competition pistols. And uh, more specifically, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see these. But if you're not watching on YouTube and you're listening, you are just probably going to be hearing some of the rackings of 2011s. And there's one Glock 34 here, too. So that's pretty cool. And uh, Ruben and Adam, all right, here's a question for you guys. When did you guys, you guys both shoot 2011s now, right? Yep. First off, can you even explain what is a 2011? Because most people might be thinking, are you just screwing up the pronunciation of the 1911 John Moses Browning Moses part of the Red Sea Old Testament World War II? Well, let's let's get it straight. John Moses Browning didn't part the Red Sea; he parted the Great Salt Lake. Okay, because Utah. Um, the so the quick story on that: uh, the 1911 comes from the military pistol issued originally around World War One. Mm-hmm. Um. As we got into the, we'll say the 80s, late 80s, um, the game of IPSC, IPSC, began taking off. And in that game, it was advantageous to have more rounds uh, in a magazine. Mm -hmm. So people wanted to blend the characteristics of the 1911 into something that would hold more ammunition. So... The original 1911, the uh, the frame and the grip are one piece. Okay. So the actual metal part that you hold in your hand is the same part that has the rails that the slide moves on. Oh, yeah. Real, real quick here. Mm-hmm. Back up one sec. What does IPSC stand for, and why would it be advantageous to have... I was really hoping you wouldn't ask me. I'm sorry. Um, no, it was uh, international... I saw it in his I eyes. I thought it might Practical paint a picture. Shooting Confederation. Shooting Confederation, yes. Really? The Confederate. Yeah. Ruben in for the save. Yes. Okay. But you so, shoot a lot, and it yep. helps to have more rounds in yep. the gun, so you don't have to load as yep. much? Po- points per second, oh, basically. Okay. okay. So uh, the more you got on board, the more points you can get. Um, but essentially, they tried to... They separated the grip from the frame into two pieces. So now they have a modular grip that they could make to accept a larger magazine. Oh, is that what they... That was like the first, one of the biggest things they wanted to do with mm-hmm. the 2011? Yep. It went from a single stack to a double stack. Yep. Yep. So it oh. went from single stack to double stack and, oh, what are we going to call it? Well, it's 1911. This is the next thing. I, STI the, dubbed it the geez. 2011. All right. So you said this thing came out, these things came out in the 80s? Here Roughly, I was thinking that they came out in 2011, and then that was just nope. like happened to be they're, right. They were commemorative commemorative editions that year, but oh, you know really? what kind of sucks. I, you know what kind of sucks though is now we're in 2019, so like, what do we have to look I mean, forward to? Right, it's basically the pinnacle has always already been reached. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we've got to wait another thousand years. <laughs> maybe the maybe there's like a super sweet Glock 19 coming out. <laughs> maybe why uh, weren't people using the Browning High Power? Wasn't that a nine millimeter double stack 1911 ish thing? That's basically for um, the characteristics that they're trying to harvest out of the 1911 is the trigger. So every yes, every pistol that has come to market pretty much since 1911, the trigger the trigger pivots on some sort of fulcrum up at the top. There's a okay. pin in the frame, yeah. and it pivots. So it makes it um, physically or mechanically harder to press it straight because it's pivoting, oh, whereas yeah. a, a 19 or 2011 pistol trigger travels straight back and forth on a track, and that's what gives it its very crisp um, uh, pull, break, and reset is, is that track that it travels in. So they're trying to capture that mechanism, and that's, that's what people really latched on to. Then they gave it some more capacity, and then, of course, all the stuff up here um, has all kinds of machine work in it to make it precise. But the reason that they latched onto this design in particular is they're trying to preserve or use that trigger mechanism mm-hmm. because it hasn't really been recreated in anything else. Now, you guys shoot 2011s. Like I said, when did you guys start shooting 2011s? And were they the first pistols that you guys started shooting for competition? It wasn't the first pistol I no. started shooting. No? When did you guys... Um, 
how, what did you start shooting with? And at what point did you feel? There's so many questions I want to ask. And I don't want to ask too many at, at once, but I want to know like, like what was the first guns you started shooting? At what point are you like, yeah, I think I'm good enough to put money into a gun. This, this, this high end, you know, like I've gotten about as good as I can get on this gun. So I, if I'm going to get any better, I need the gun to keep up with me. Like, how do you, what happened? There's there? a, well, yeah, there's a few answers there. So, uh, <clears throat> I want to touch one on one other thing too, with, uh, with a Glock, uh, grip angle, um, before we move too far. Ahead. Oh, grip angle is um, big on it. I hear it all the time. So yeah. in shootability and the, the way that you grip a gun and the way you hold it, and then also the way that your body posture is while you're shooting, um, the grip angle on a 1911 is much steeper. Whereas, uh, the Glock grip angle, a lot of, uh, common polymer frame pistols, the grip angle is much more, um, angled forward. And so what that, ha- what that makes you do as you're gripping the gun as, um, it'll, it'll actually make you lean forward, more mm-hmm. um and that's not quite as natural as the what a grip angle on a 1911 will do or a 2011 you'll actually be able to stand more upright uh and have a much more natural relaxed shooting mm-hmm. kind of posture which is ultimately what you want when you're shooting you don't want to be uh crouched in or yeah. in having that like tactical turtle kind of feel even just, turtle, right? It's funny you use the word posture because I was just going to use that same word. It's almost as if the gun itself has good posture and it almost requires you to have good posture or, yep. or um, not forces, but and a you lot have of good it, posture as well. Yeah, a lot of it goes into the way that the different cultures of shooting have taught posture and uh, shooting technique and form too. Um, the in, in competitive shooting, you want to be relaxed. You want to be upright. You don't want to be all hunched over. And so the, the grip angle of a 2011 or 1911 lends that to be done much more easily. So, no, I guess, is there a time that you don't want that? I was going to say, are there, are like there advantages why? to something? Yeah, I like would, this tends to be a more duty, co- like you don't see people carrying around 2011s often for like duty or military. Or police it's becoming, am I wrong? Know, it's getting a resurgence, but yeah, on the, on the whole, you're correct. Okay. Um, if we go into, into duty and military use, uh, those decisions aren't always based on the merits of the pistol itself. So that's the first thing. Um, but yeah, there's a lot in this type of pistol that made it successful, that made it less attractive for competition shooting. The a Glock lot of, a lot of, case. yeah, the Glock and its derivatives by other companies. Right, other polymer. I mean, they're going for this polymer frame, you know, because that's cheap. Um, it's easy, you know, it's expensive. Yeah. And, you know, armor serviceable. I mean, you don't need to be a craftsman to service one of these. You know, you can right. you can find it all on YouTube. Um, where there's a fair amount of craftsman knowledge it would take to to uh, hand fit some of the parts that go into a 2011. Um, and then I would say the big one that keeps 2011s alive is the trigger systems have passive safeties built into them. So so this gun is on safe when you're not touching it. Right, you know the the thing you say in the gun store is you can like throw it across the room, and when they did the FBI demos and all that stuff, that's what they would do in front of a bunch of agents. They would just load it and throw it across the room, and nothing would happen. Um, and then as you press the trigger, you start deactivating these safeties mm-hmm. passively. So you've already started shooting, but you're deactivating safeties. That's all slack and slop uh, in a trigger pull that we would want to get rid of for competition shooting, okay, because yeah. that's that's potential to disturb the shot. Okay. Gotcha. And, and I would say, to answer your original question, I think Ruben and I both started with Glocks, uh, various models of them. Um, but we were both shooting Glocks when we met. And then... Um, 2009, I think. Yeah, ish. Is that your How I Met story? Um, yeah, I was like, oh, bro, is that a Glock? <laughs> yeah, bro. I have one, too. <laughs> yeah. um, but, like, as we started getting into the sport, spending more time in the sport, and, like, you know, investing a significant amount of money into the sport, it's like, well, all right, so... I shoot this pistol a lot. I would really like to improve the trigger. Okay. You know, so you start dropping in improved trigger parts. You start putting... $150, $200 there. Yep. You start putting mag wells on. To make the, essentially, a magazine well more like a vacuum cleaner yep. for your mags. Yep. So just a little bit more of a funnel to reload. You start changing out sights. Then you start thinking about, hmm, maybe I should reduce the mass on this slide so that it re- recoils differently. You start playing around with different springs on your recoil springs. Striker springs, um, 
you know, you can go to different uh, a different extractor. You can go to tungsten guide rod, mm-hmm. stainless uh, springs. Manipulate um, the grip. <clears throat> yeah, before you know it, uh, six hundred and seventy five dollar Glock thirty four is fourteen fifteen hundred dollars. And then you did that math, and it's like, well, it's kind of like Forrest Gump. Like, oh, I've come this far. Might as well keep going. Um, so you can make the jump. And no matter how much money you spend on this pistol, it'll never be like this because the frame still flexes. There's still slop and vibrations in it that you just can't get out of it. So Can you feel that when you're shooting? I can't now. You can't now? Yeah. yeah. Kind of like uh, as you shoot more and more, you start to – when when you first shoot, you, you hear a – you know, early in your shooting career, whatever you want to call it, you hear a bang and recoil. And then further down the road after you doing it for a while, you start to feel, you know, your trigger prep and then you feel the break and then you feel the slide cycle. And before you know it, like 30, 40,000 rounds down the road, you're seeing the sight cycle and you're mm-hmm. feeling the gun move so you don't, as uh, you shoot. You don't as much have that, like, um, borderline blackout when you just like you pull the trigger something happened and now yeah mm -hmm. so a lot of that happens kind of subconsciously um the action of shooting but then it allows you so you're thinking about all that at first and so you miss what's happening when the gun goes off then as the shooting the act of shooting pressing a trigger prepping the trigger gripping the gun that becomes a subconscious act that happens naturally when you decide you want the gun to go off the gun should never surprise you despite what the internet says right um you should know exactly when that gun's going to go off and so that all becomes a subconscious a part of the subconscious and then it frees up your ability to focus on what's happening when the gun is cycling so you do over time you'll notice like um you'll have these little breakthrough moments where you're like i can see the sights moving I can watch that happen. Interesting. Do you, th- do you think we've touched on this kind of in a, in a couple of different ways in the past, but do you think for a person who is interested in pistol shooting or maybe they even have a pistol or whatever, is there an advantage to maybe starting with something that's not as custom so you, so you can kind of see some of those things happen, or is all that's going to give you is a greater appreciation should, for when you get something like this? You should this? start with what you can afford. Yeah. And and you should you should get the nicest gun that you can for what you can afford when you start. And yeah. sometimes, um, there you're not going to get any argument from um, top shooters in in the sport of three gun or IPSC. You know, there's there's some offshoots of different models of guns like a CZ Checkmate or um, like a Tang Folio or something like that where those guns operate really nice too. And they're Virgil they're, has one of those, doesn't he? They're Cadillacs. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, our test department here at Vortex has a couple of those too. So, uh, there's, there's definitely other nice guns out there that aren't 2011s and where you can start to really not have to focus on a, a bad trigger or something like that. But, uh, ultimately there's, there are things that, that a 2011 does. I mean, when Adam and myself are, are at a match and we see a brand new shooter that rolls up with a $7,000 Infinity, we're kind of like, oh, you should have started with something a little bit less expensive so you can work through all this stuff. Yeah. But it's uh, there, you know, Jimmy, you mentioned it earlier. You talked about a little bit about like, I'm a good enough shooter to appreciate the benefits of this other gun. Mm-hmm. There's definitely. If you start with a 2011 or a 1911 or a high-end pistol, you're never going to have those breakthrough moments where you realize what you actually gained mm-hmm. by going to that system that you would, like, if you learned the hard way. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, if you switch from a polymer frame pistol to something like this, you're going to have that aha moment where you're like, wow, this is what I've been missing. You won't have that if you start with this gun. But um, there's you do hear a lot of people talk about, like, well, you know... Bob Vogel shoots that Glock really well or, um, you know, other like Shane Coley's or people who shoot a polymer frame pistol extremely well at a Mm -hmm. very high level. Um, so you get, you get people that are Mm -hmm. like, well, unless you're better than him, then you didn't outperform that pistol. But I mean, Jimmy, here's your car reference. Uh, Yeah. Can, can, can you drive faster in a Corvette than a Toyota Corolla? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, it, the car itself is going to go faster. Oh yeah. Yeah. It, it the, the driver still has better, to be able to control it, better. but that that gun is still faster. Mm-hmm. It's still better tuned. It still works for that application of being on a racetrack going faster. Yeah. So 
can you drive a Corolla really well around a track? Yeah, you can. But you can beat a moron in the Corvette. Yep. But you know. this car is still going to go faster than that car. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It's still going to go faster. And that when I sense. was in retail sales, kind of maybe more to the root of your question, like there's most people get into this, they're not going all in and buying right. premium stuff right away. So they're buying on some kind of budget. And my crusade while I was in the gun store was everyone's going to have this step, whatever it is, you know, whatever model pistol it is. Some polymer, yep. relatively inexpensive pistol. Yep. And then yep. there's an in-between step that a lot of people try to take. They try to take the, well, it's a little bit better than this, so they try to upgrade this. Yeah. They're going to drop 1500 $1, bucks yep. into either this pistol or some other thing. We're not going to make fun of those other companies because they're all our friends too, but they're trying to take this intermediate step. Well, I don't need to buy a 2011 because I'm buying Blank. this. And invariably, those people will come back and they would buy one of these and they'll all be like, I wish I would have just bought. So my, I was like, Shoot this as long as you want, as long as you can. But as soon as you're going to spend more than 500 bucks on this pistol, just start putting it in a pickle jar and saving up for one of these. Because mm -hmm. this is where you're going to end up eventually, and you're going to lose 60% of your money trading this in. Right. So I feel like I'm in the exact same boat right now with the bolt guns, because we were just discussing this right. in my Ruger American, yeah. mm -hmm. where I've been shooting that for so long. It just went through four vortex extremes. I still have it. It's like, six years old, seven years old at this point. And I, I've i gotten to the point now where I've been trying to out, just like, just gut it out, which I don't hate the gun by any means. It's very, very accurate, but there's just little quirks about it that I'm like, after I've hung around people here at work who build all these custom rifles all the time, it's like, I used to make fun of people with the custom rifles because I was like, check out my Ruger American. I can hit steel at a thousand yards too. And I paid like a th one eighth the price of yours. And then, you know, I'd shoot theirs, and I'm like, yeah, whatever. Yours is super cool and expensive, but mine can do that, too. And then now I'm six or seven years in, and I'm like, you know, a bolt that maybe moves a little smoother would be kind of nice. Or, like, a trigger that's maybe a smidge lighter would be You know, it's these little yeah. things that... You learn to appreciate the finer things. Yeah, you think, do. Yeah. That well, just comes with age and, and also experience, right? I guess with, oftentimes come with age, you have more experiences. But you've run that thing a, a lot. Yeah. Well, and if you're really into it, you spend a lot of time with it too. Like, right. you really only needed that flip phone that we had a long time ago for a cell phone to make phone calls and do right. text. But now it's like an integral part of your life. So now it's like, you know, I really like having the touch screen and I like that it auto dims at night and it has a camera too. And so it's kind of like how much when time. I get an email. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How much time you spend with some of these guns is part of it too. Like, when you're in the sport to the point where, like, you're holding this gun every day. It's like I want it to feel a little bit more solid, you know. I wish it would. I wish it would click, mm -hmm. yeah, a little bit more positively because it's in your hand all the time, and then you know you're shooting it all the time. So that you know, you, when you're just putting around few or putting down that many rounds a year, it's like, well, this is this is kind of a big part of my life. So I'd rather have one really nice one. Yeah, you know, if yeah. you're, let's say you you know money aside, or maybe you've got you know mm -hmm. plenty of funds. Is a and a person wants to get into you know this style of shooting. Are they if they went this more you know custom purpose built route? Are they potentially more likely to learn better habits or not develop some bad habits because they've um, got a they've got you know something that's purpose built for the application or I is that I don't think so. I think you're gonna have you're gonna have the learning curve either way. Um, so my girlfriend is learning the sport of three gun right now. She just happens to have started with a 2011 cause I didn't want to buy her a Glock, you know? So it's like, well, here, shoot this one. But she still has the learning curve of all the intricacies of the sport and everything. And there's some quirks to the gun too, you know, that you just have to learn. Yeah. And, and she'll be like, well, I did it right. And I'm like, yeah. You kind of did, but you kind of, <laughs> you kind of didn't. Um, you know, I like so, to say so she can download this. Yeah, yeah she doesn't listen to this. Yeah, right? I say it to her face too. Um, but you know, it's um, so there's a learn. You know, it's not like it's not like that old adage of well, I want them to start on irons before they got a scope. You know, yeah, it's like yeah. well, it's just an inter it's just an interface. You still have to learn how to shoot. You know. Oh, okay. So, still have to learn how to shoot a scope. Yeah, it's so. true. That's true. Um, 
So you guys have right now in front of us, here's, here's another thing that baffles me when I look into the world of 2011s and competition pistols and stuff. Um, there are five 2011s on the table in front of us. I have a problem. Y- yes. I don't. Um, <laughs> what? I have kids. <laughs> <laughs> what is, uh, why are there five? Like what they all look the same ish to me. I mean, they don't get me wrong. These all look different in like cool colors and different cuts on the slides and stuff. But yeah, Adam, you remember that intervention we did with Mark? Yeah. Oh, shit, this is it. <laughs> so, yep. You're uh, you're in for it. You're Man, in. I'm for in the it. corner too. <laughs> I'll be honest. The way these were all pointed at, at the start and still are, I was wondering if this was some sort of intervention me or tactical <laughs> I don't know we gotta get you a pistol we now. broke Mark. you ever play rough, Russian roulette yeah <laughs> and then we'll do the shotgun one and then yeah. uh, you already have those though but uh, so how does one figure out like what are the differences between these Why? what would make somebody do certain things with their night or 2011 over other certain things like how do you well, I wasn't Get I wasn't one. quite sure what rabbit trail we would go down so I, I brought some representative samples since <laughs> I have a lot of them um, but like this was my first one and it's more representative of an older style. Um, if you rewind about five years ago, they were making the guns really heavy up front. Hmm. They weren't taking a lot of mass off the slide, things like that. Uh, why do I have them still and why are so many? This one, it may be kind of segueing from our, our conversation there. This was my first one because I actually won the frame for this one. This one started off as just a frame. Oh, okay. And a grip. Well, no, just a frame. Just a frame. And then it was kind of one of those deals. I had a blue collar at the time and, and did a did a job that Mike Rowe would do a, a Dirty Jobs TV show for. Um, and then, you know, brought it to a gunsmith and was like, all right, I want you to build, you know, build me a pistol. And he built this up. And my kind of, my deal is when, when somebody, when a pistol smith builds you a gun from scratch, a, a true custom gun, for you, I have a hard time selling it, so I just nostalgically yeah. hold on to them. Even yeah, though I've fair. pretty much retired that one at this point, um, it's it's gone through a few iterations and, and things like that too. That was a experimental finish at the time. Okay, um, yeah, it looks kind of like a uh, like a almost coppery bronze. Yeah, it's, cool. it's a PVD kind of. Yeah, but um, you know the guns have kind of evolved the way from, especially on the custom side. They've kind of evolved. This one has a polymer grip with a stippling job done to it. A lot of the guns now are moving more towards various types of metal grips. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, well, some of these guns, you put them in your hand, and you almost feel like you're going to be drawing blood just yep. holding it. Yep. So just a representative sample of of more of a, a basic one or an older style of gun. When we talked to Jerry about those stipple uh, grips and stuff like that, he said he doesn't really like it. No, yeah. He's, Jerry's kind of the opposite. He kind of likes the the gun to like slip oh, or move a little re- a bit in his hand, so yeah. he can kind of get it in the right spot. He doesn't want it to be stuck in one spot. Yeah. Yep. He yeah. doesn't want to have to break his grip to have to regrip the gun. Is that yeah. unusual? Do most people like the stipple, or do most people not? Or is it I think it probably split. You know, it probably depends on like what generation you came into the shooting sports mm-hmm. and what was cool at the time. So Jerry was big into revolvers, right? And so revolvers have a very different grip. You actually take your left hand and you wrap your thumb around the back, right? Right. Because there's okay. no slide reciprocating. So what Jerry wants to do with a revolver is he's talking about doing eight shots in under two seconds, right? And then throw in a reload, which you have to completely break your grip on the gun transfer the gun into your other hand, reload this way, and then transfer it back. So he doesn't want that grip because as soon as you put any pressure on any of these, like this is a Phoenix Trinity Evo grip, this is probably the one you're referencing where it feels like it's going to cut into your hand. Yeah, but as soon as you put any Christmas. any pressure on that grip, it's locked into place, and you can't right. break that grip. It is. It's so not if moving. you get a bad grip on that gun, it's going to stay there, and you're going to have that flaw, whether it be a, a pull to the right, a press to the left, or a push to the left, or a press directly to the rear, you're going to have that grip the whole time. So, yeah, um, in a revolver shooting, yeah, Jerry is he's a big proponent of ha- being able to regrip the gun at any time if you get a bad grip. Mm-hmm. So, um, well, I guess I mean I would picture him just by needing to manipulate it like mm-hmm. that quickly. Like you said, any sort of tackiness would be put him in a disadvantage. And, and one of the things that 
was done back before, you know, taking a soldering iron to your Glock or M&P was cool was uh, liquid grip. So they would actually take like a chalk, a liquid chalk that dries out, uh, weightlifting chalk. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, yeah. And I still, I mean, there's there's plenty of matches where I shoot a gun at that I apply that before I shoot because that's if the gun doesn't have that aggressive texturing, uh, you can have compromised grip if you get sweaty or anything. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, mm-hmm. that. But that when Jerry was really coming up in you know, early '90s and uh, throughout the early 2000s, all the way up to current day, um, there's a lot of things that have changed in shooting sports and different trends with manufacturers and stuff. But when he learned and the way that he learned, that was smooth grips, and you uh, apply the chalk if you need it. Interesting. And then also, too, like some of the key different, you know, some differences that people spend a lot of time arguing about, you felt that one. So if you feel this one, this one's the same operation, just done differently. So when they actually machine the ones that are super sharp, they just use a bigger bit. And really, it's just burrs. If you look at the circles that they milled it with, it's the same same operation. They just went a a larger diameter so that the, um, the ridges between the machining circle pockets is smaller that makes it feel sharper oh so, yeah i see these so ones guys are, would uh, debate the differences between these grip grips for hours on end <laughs> really it's the same operation just done a little bit differently interesting yeah i see that and when adam was talking about his first gun here this uh the frame was the part that he started with right so to be clear this is the frame just the part underneath the slide that yep, goes out yep. to the end of the gun yeah, this part here uh, whether it be on the one you're holding or this gun, this is just a, a grip. This comes off with four screws. I'd comes say right that. off, and your frame is completely separate of that uh, of the grip. So that's uh, that's what These, he was referencing the, there. The one your first one, and then the one that I'm holding now, they don't look very much different. They aren't very. What's really, di- what is different um, about well, them? Well, different like, manufacturers. Them? Uh, this one's a forty. Oh, different. Uh, oh, yep. so, different caliber. So that one's that one's set up for this this major power factor in USPSA. Major power factor. Um, the main reason I brought it out is for the barrel on that one. If you look at the top, the barrel on that one is what's called an island barrel. Oh, it doesn't. So uh, there's a big flat on the top that has the iron sight or the front sight. The, I- the front into it. sight doesn't move when right. you shoot it. Right, so that's a, a very oh, expensive a feature fixed, that people pay for. Is it a fixed barrel or what? How no, does it it's not? the same barrel. They just they just it's a bull barrel. Yeah, they machined that rib on there. Yeah, and then they cut the slide around it. So it's How it's very not, decorative uh, uh, machine work. Um, is it doing that thing though, where barrels like cant up a little mm-hmm. bit? Yeah, still? It drops mm-hmm. out a battery. It doesn't look yep. like very much. But you know, it was originally sold huh. as being like a revolver, where your your front side isn't going to move, so it's easier to track. Uh, Do you find I, that it is? I would challenge you to honestly t- tell the difference. Right. I don't. I don't. I don't know that the human eye can really detect that. Um, right. Some people would argue it, but what it is um, when we start talking about like recoil characteristics of the gun, which is what makes a lot of these attractive, it is a way to take reciprocating mass off the slide and put okay. it onto the barrel. Sure. That so makes sense. So we can we can reduce slide mass. Oh. without changing the profile of the pistol by putting that material on the barrel. So representative sample of an, an island barrel there for that one. Rubens is too, but he doesn't have a front sight on it because his is milled for an optic. Yes. Hmm. Yep. That one also, that one's an infinity, a unique one about that, is you can actually change calibers in that one. So they have a modular breech face. Is that not something that you can normally do nope. on? Nope. Usually the, usually the breech is milled for a certain size cartridge. So that's the part at the back of yep. the, uh, the part opening. That, yep, the part that the firing pin comes through. Okay, yeah. Um, you can change that out in an Infinity pistol. That's one of the proprietary things they do. So you can actually switch calibers in the same gun. It All sounds right. cooler than it is because it's actually kind of a pain in the butt to do. And there's a little, <laughs> there's a teeny tiny screw inside there that gets stripped out pretty easy. So I don't, I don't have a conversion kit for that one, but that's a unique thing that those do as well. All right. Um, and then, um, yeah, so just kind of some earlier representative samples. These are more of the ones that, that I use now. I was shooting this one when I was uh, shooting TAC Optics and Limited and then um, decided to move to open. So I had a similar pistol built to take uh, a red dot. And so these are these are kind of the two that I use a lot now. That one has a comp on it, does it not? Yes. That silver one there? Yep. And what? And I, I don't understand comps on pistols. How does that, what's going on there? Think of it, I would... Th- I would describe it as like a moderator. 
you know, the recoil impulse is going to be different with every kind of ammunition that you put in there. You know, if you push a bullet at different weight bullets at different velocities, they're going to feel different when they come out. Sure. I think what the compensator really does in a caliber like 9 millimeter is just kind of smooth that all out. It kind of negates it. But it doesn't um so they all it doesn't the screw up the cycling of the gun. Uh the gun's tuned to have that on there. So yes, the the slide, the slide on this gun is a very specific mass to compensate for the weight okay. that's on there. How about when people sometimes will put comps to just like throw them on the end of a threaded barrel on a Glock or something like that? Does that because, well, you so know, like, I, I, I think of a comp as counteracting, like, the up yeah. and back. And mm-hmm. then when I also think about a pistol with a with a not fixed barrel, the barrel has to go out of breach to go down to mm-hmm. pick up a round. And if you have something on the front of it trying to push it down, wouldn't that screw with stuff? Or the, is that well, just the all? The bullet's already left before that happens. Okay. So the bullet's already gone before, before, that, the, before the slide starts moving. Take this Glock 34 okay. and feel the... the when you cycle the slide, right. feel how much spring tension there is and how hard that is. Right. Now, now take something like this, which is tuned to work with the integral comp and the island barrel, and feel how light that spring tension is. Oh, yeah. Comparatively. It's yeah. So I that, can do it with like one finger pretty much. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, like something like a Glock 34, Glock 17, uh, M&Ps, uh, any, you know, you name, you name a, a polymer frame pistol. Um, they're, they're designed for reliability. They're not designed for shootability in terms of like being a well fine tuned machine, right? They're designed to function every time you press the trigger and to not, not, uh, not malfunction, but they're just designed for reliability. You've all heard of like taking a Glock and freezing it in a five gallon bucket of ice and throwing it out of a helicopter onto concrete, right? And it shoots when it hits the ground. Um, that, for for that reason that it's designed for reliability and function, um, there are going to be certain aspects of it that when you're shooting it, it just isn't tuned right. I mean, for example, you can take this gun out of the box. It comes with a 15 pound recoil spring, and you can drop a seven or eight pound recoil spring in that gun. Shoot lighter ammo, and it'll cycle every time. Hmm. So hmm. for something like this, I'm running an eight pound recoil spring uh, in this pistol. And that gun is designed to function at that with this comp with pretty much any ammo I put in it. So there's, you know, like throwing a comp on a Glock, I guess what I'm getting at is there's there's a ton of, th- there's not a lot of leeway in this gun. When, when I start switching things in it, like okay. if I were to, you know, for some, if I had the ability to like, plug these compensator holes the gun's going to function completely differently because it's tuned to operate right at this level yeah now a glock has a lot of uh if you throw a comp on it right there's there's a lot of like space in between here where it can still function oh i see you know it can function here and it can function here and it's not going to be like driving a cadillac but it's going to cycle and go bang every time you press the trigger. So if you throw a comp on a Glock, it might take that level down to here, but there's still a very large margin yeah, you're, where it's going to function. So, your level there is almost like a, uh, I mean, some people call it a margin for error or something like that. Mm-hmm. Like there's just, it has more leeway. And so if you change some things up, you're not necessarily taking right. up all that available leeway that it mm-hmm. has to still function. Yep. Most, most choices you make, in part selection or ammo selection, one of these, it has a very direct consequence where I think there's a lot of tolerance in the, the yeah. Glock and similar designs. Yeah, yeah. striker so they, fired polymer pistols. Yeah, yeah, you don't get as direct of an output for a direct change yeah. necessarily. Every time I've seen anything that's designed for essentially competition and racing, you find that people really start making stuff be very particular, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's like race engines. They take a very specific kind of gas, a very specific at, kind of fuel pressure, and all these things. Look at Ian's competition guns, right? I yeah. Mean, those guns are very, very purpose-built for what he's doing for them. Yeah. And if you... Uh, class. Do you guys find that with these kinds of things, too, and again, I'm just trying to parallel to things that I know well, but, like, race engines need to be rebuilt frequently. You know, I mean, they might campaign it for one race or even maybe a couple of races, but then it's getting, it's getting pulled in 
taken apart and mm-hmm. rebuilt, right? Mm-hmm. Do you guys find that you have to do that kind of stuff, like essentially more major maintenance to these things on a more frequent basis, or is that a little bit different? Um, I definitely, we definitely have to change springs. Uh, I, you know, on Ruben and my schedule, we're probably changing recoil springs once a season, once every other mm-hmm. season. Okay. And magazine springs. I buy, I buy the recoil springs like in a pack of five, and I just one every year. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but the the magazines that feed these those magazine springs get changed a lot because the cartridge has to get presented yep. very consistently yeah. to the feed ramp, and that spring is under a lot of stress because it also has you know a very long range of motion and mm-hmm. it gets compressed really small. Yeah, and things. so it's a fragile. Pretty, they're pretty long grips that yeah. the frame that the yep. magazine. How many rounds does one of these magazines hold usually? Um. So the Nine the millimeter. game. The game regulates to, um, in most divisions or limited, it's 140 millimeters in length on the magazine. And then it's how many you can stuff in there. That's where the springs get kind of fragile because they're they're trying to to stuff as many as they can into that. Only for countries who haven't been to the moon. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So it's more more of a... Uh, distance than yep. or a length. Yep. And then open division, you can have 170 millimeters. So you're talking between roughly 21 rounds of nine millimeter yep. or 19 to 20 rounds of 40. And then in open division, you're talking about somewhere between 26 and 30 rounds oh, in a okay. magazine. Yeah, that's quite a few. I have heard, we talked about in the firearms maintenance podcast with Adrian and Pete, they discussed magazines as being one of the integral pieces to a firearm that everybody neglects. And Mm -hmm. I've heard a lot of people, you know, um, I can't, I guess it's just, it could be just sitting around tables and stuff after three gun matches or talking with competition guys and, um, pistol shooters, uh, talking about people who are complaining about their 2011s only to find out it's just the mags. Mm-hmm. That yeah, does so that a magazine, pretty? a magazine for a double stack, nineteen eleven, twenty eleven, whatever, is steel. It's Stamp, tuned, stamped sheet metal. Yep, it's uh, it's got a very specific spring length, and you, the follower that you use is very specific to get a certain round count. Mm-hmm. And springs, regardless of what any misconceptions out there, springs you could leave the magazines up on your shelf that are loaded. Oh, those, yeah, these have been here since we moved into the new studio. Those could stay loaded for 10 years, and you unload them, and the spring tension is still there. Springs wear out when you cycle them. When they cycle, right. Right. So, and when we're talking about going to uh, a match and practicing, and, you know, typically, like, my schedule um, for my first my first four years. So I shot a Glock 34 in competition for the first four years that I shot. So to 2013. I got my first 2011 in late 2013. The first four years, my schedule was um, shooting USPSA uh, and three gun um, between 12,500 rounds a year and 16,000. The most I shot in that first four years was 16,000 rounds in nine mil a year through one, one Glock 34. Um, I change the magazine springs every year um, and change the the recoil spring every year. Um, going now, uh, right now, I shoot between twenty and 26,000 for the last five years of pistol um, through this gun. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I change the recoil springs about half uh, the same uh, once a year, but the mag springs I'll throw in about every six months just for certain magazines. There's certain mm-hmm. magazines I don't shoot as much either. Um, my practice mags, those are the ones that are going to get changed. Okay. Um, and are you actually seeing, like, a deterioration in performance there, or is that just yes. kind of, like, your general maintenance? Well, like, there's a couple. Yeah, so, yeah, so um, there's a couple of things, depending upon the terrain where we shoot, whether it be a pistol-only match or a three-gun match or whatever it is. Um, we go to Vegas and we shoot, and you're shooting in these, like, giant three-inch breaker rocks, and a magazine, when you drop the magazine oh, to do mm-hmm. a change, that, you know, if the feed lips hit first, that it's now indented. And Adam has a mag tuning kit for that, so we can go back and adjust those feed lips. But, um, yeah, typically if you start seeing malfunctions in a gun at a match that are, you know, not out of the ordinary, it's like the first thing you do is you take that mag and set it over here. Okay. Don't touch it the rest of the match. When you say mm-hmm. not out of the ordinary and you're talking about malfunctions, okay, are yeah. you talking about like, is that just like, is a stove pipe? You're kind of like, or... 
I can't even think still, of what's still what's pipe, an out I would of the question ordinary. I would question the gun, so I would start yeah. to question lubrication and the recoil spring. Um, with magazines, it's uh, usually feed way stoppages, so feed, cartridges that didn't issues. didn't present to the chamber. I was oh, talking so about like, like once in a while you'll get something where like a a trigger something in the trigger assembly, and the gun will double tap when you don't expect it to. Or oh, okay. um, you know that's that's a that's a very specific thing. That gun gets taken out and put in a bag. Then you go to your buddy's gun, but. Uh, yeah, like feed issues, okay. uh, ejection issues. Um, that magazine immediately gets pulled out, set aside. We'll look at it after the match, but I don't want to be thinking about that magazine mm-hmm. while I'm shooting. Yep. So you must usually take extras then to the matches, right? Yep. Yeah, I think they're Adam, all numbered. Yep. They're all numbered. That they're all seems marked. to make sense. Um, but I yeah. usually bring 12 mags for a pistol to mm-hmm. a three gun match. That's my standard. I imagine that's a pretty quick <laughs> check, right? To basically take that mag, set it aside, insert maybe almost like a control mag, something that you know is mm-hmm. new or has been working mm-hmm. flawlessly, yep. you have, and then oh, all of a sudden it's working fine. Yep. You know, now I know. Yeah. Yep. And that's kind of one of those deals. The mag is most susceptible to those issues because of what it's made out of and and how much abuse they take. So and there's you usually have more than one of them. So they're usually the first suspect. So if you can remove a mag from the mm-hmm. equation and the thing and the problem doesn't persist it's like all right it's probably something to do with that magazine whereas if you use you know having marked all your magazines you don't see that pattern it's like all right now we might have an ammunition or a gun yeah issue mm-hmm. jimmy you asked a question too about the durability and like uh you know changing out certain parts like if you were to break this gun down any of these guns down um you would find that the internal components the the barrel the slide the frame the grip um, they're far more robust than what you're going to find in like a polymer frame pistol. Yeah. Um, really? So yes, there are some wear parts that, you know, think, you know, standard yearly maintenance, you're going to change out a couple of things every couple of years. I'm going to throw a different extractor in. Um, you're going to make sure that your trigger components are functioning properly, but this gun uh, being a steel frame, steel grip, steel slide barrel everything is is not going to see the slow decrease in performance over time that you're going to see with mm-hmm. a lot of guns and so a lot of it, people, I've, I've shot a polymer frame pistol to the point where like the frame cracks and that's right. it yeah so it's not necessarily um less durable uh-uh. but it 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 is Maybe I'll just say this flat out, and then you guys can um, correct me if I'm wrong. It is less reliable. Um, oh. It's a more oh. finely tuned machine. Like okay. so, so people yeah. made the comment a bunch of times. Like, how could you? Like, I'll. I mean, I'll drop any one of these pistols on the floor. Right. Right now. You know, I, we, we we do a lot make, of abuse. We won't make you do that. We but. do a lot of abuses. I did it in classes too, and they're like, "Oh, well, that must have really hurt you to drop that, or it's got a scratch on it." Like, we'll we'll do a lot to these pistols abuse wise and not think a whole lot of about it we will not do that same abuse to the mags like the magazines will that's like the epitome of superstition like if a magazine touches the ground outdoors like we're gonna he take, takes it out of the match. I, will, I will take it well i'll take it apart i'll take it all the way apart <laughs> it gets microfiber cloth through it to get all the dust out of it and everything and we'll put it back together like there's the, the magazines are far more finicky than the guns are Interesting. Even though the magazine costs sixty dollars and the gun costs, you know, hmm. factor, of yeah, 100. four figures. <laughs> and somewhere. I would say too, like there's a lot of components in in a gun like this that are made to perform at that high level. Uh, you know, this trigger press, um, when this trigger breaks, it's right at about two and a half pounds. Dang. Okay. Yeah. Compare that to a seven pound stock polymer frame pistol trigger. Right. Okay. So when you say something like that pistol it isn't as reliable if i wanted a certain component of this pistol to be as reliable as a polymer frame pistol i mean it would could be as simple as changing out something that's very finely tuned and putting in a, a little bit more uh of a mm, i don't know what i would say but like a, a heavier trigger spring or something like that yeah because as you increase the performance that you're looking to get whether that be trigger press or whether that be you know the spring weight um, so that your your gun cycles uh, exactly the right amount back as it ejects that spent cartridge, um, 
then it's going to be a little more finicky. However, if you wanted to make that thing far more robust, you would just simply swap out some of those parts and make it, um, it would be a little more uh, archaic or rough in its function. But Mm -hmm. I don't Mm -hmm. think that there's anything other than a magazine that would make it not yeah. as reliable. Mm-hmm. Would you freeze yours in a five-gallon bucket of water and then shoot it immediately? And- I paid four thousand dollars. Why would I do that? <laughs> well, yeah, a lot, a lot of that stuff's kind of asinine too. Like, I mean, a lot of some of the some of the optics demos that people do. I mean, like, does it really make sense? No. Oh, I hear you. You know, I use it as but, a hammer. Does it work for that? Right. Like, well, no. If it, was, if it was supposed to be a hammer, we would design it as a hammer. You know, <laughs> but like uh, also if too, I, Stanley I'm, makes a heck of a hammer. Yeah. If yeah, I've right? been underwater with my pistol $7. for They're now twenty-four hours, yeah, like I got bigger problems than my. But pistol. like, there's five hundred people in the world that do that. Actually, like most people don't do that. True, <laughs> it's know? so true. So, um, you know, and then you also look at like the round count that these are doing. So, like, are they reliable? Well, how many pist- you know, how many Glock pistols of the Jillions of them that are out there. How many of them see a firing schedule of twelve thousand rounds a year? Mm-hmm. Not, not very many. And That's those that fair. do yeah. do it, but like you know, I mean, people will see one hiccup on a, on this style of pistol and be like, "Oh, it's not reliable." It's like, well, you didn't see the other I, eleven thousand rounds, you know, <laughs> and and like the 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 certain things that just this our biases as being out on the range a lot the people that make an argument for a polymer frame striker fired pistol in competition are usually saying well the reliability you know i i see a guy who's um you know his 2011 stove pipes all the time or he has feeding issues all the time and it's like okay let's take two people let's put the appropriate maintenance and gun care into both platforms and i will tell you that you will have less issues with the platform that's designed for what we're doing it with um, than the one that we're taking off of a duty holster and shooting it in competition. And usually it's like the tendency of people when they see one of these guns malfunction, it's like, oh, it's the ammo. Oh, it's, <laughs> ah, it's dirty. I haven't cleaned it in, you know, four years. Like, yeah. Go stand but by this gun malfunctions. Gun. That's why you never <laughs> use one of those. That's, they just They just do that all the time. That's an interesting point you make. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I carry guns like this. I don't carry this one, but right, it's very similar. Okay, you know, and it's made by the same. You know, it's made by Atlas Gunworks too. All so. right, interesting. Um, how do the you guys spoke briefly a little bit to the hand fitted nature of these things? These things are literally hand built. They like got to hand file them and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. How, um, how does that? work? Companies happen? are moving a little bit more towards automation on mm-hmm. some of that, not for mass production, but um, there's a certain amount of hand fitting that's not consistent. I mean, you you can't right. get a straight line. So, like companies like Atlas and Infinity and um, uh, Haze. Haze, thank you. Um, they're they're moving more towards CNC machining on critical parts. So they're getting their parts closer to fitting before the hand fitting process Okay, yeah, it's starts. like the old classic Detroit uh, USA automakers, you know, yep. when they came through and their people smacking yep. body panels with rubber mallets. I think that there's a lot of, you know, when, when something was getting built before, they would take a slide from here and a frame from here, mm-hmm. try and fit it together, and now they're being made like when whenever Travis or myself or Adam, if we get... Uh, a gun belt. I mean, they're taking a slide and a frame that fit already. Like precision right. matched mm-hmm. rings. Yes. yes. A precision matched pistol parts. Pistols. And, and what you're getting there primarily, well, one is longevity. So the better the parts fit together, the longer a pistol is going to last. Okay. So realistically, I mean, again, I have a, a gun problem, so I buy too many of them. But like the one you buy, the custom pistol you buy, realistically is the last pistol you'll ever have to buy. I mean, they'll, they'll go the distance for several years until you retire from the sport. Um, but um, So it's longevity, but also it's in recoil impulse and the locomotion of the pistol. So how smooth does the barrel unlock when it, when it comes out of battery? What spec is that? So how far does it move before it drops? And then what does the slide feel like? Or, you know, the more precise the slide is, the smoother it will slide the part the slide will move back and forth on the rails no chatter and vibrations things like that that's all things you can feel under recoil yeah so how smooth does it go back and forth how smooth does a cartridge come out of the magazine up the feed ramp into the chamber that all that all translates into what you feel as the gun 
goes back and forth, yeah. you know, in two tenths of a second. Is that what ordinarily people are quote hand fitting? I hear I've heard the term hand fitting a lot, but I've always wondered like what are they doing so you that's have different? This, you, like, got, you got you got a couple of things. So you have your slide frame fit. So okay. is that is that that's the that's slide your, to the base essentially that it slides back yep, and forth yeah, on top of. Yeah, there's going to be rails that this moves back and forth on. Okay. And then you're going to have if you got a bull barrel system like this one here or like this one here, a bull barrel is going to be fit, right? They're actually going to take material off the top of the barrel to get that to go into battery, right? Hmm. So that's actually, I mean, I've seen like guys take literally sandpaper and fit the top of that barrel hmm. okay. as it goes. Now, if you run a if you run a bushing barrel, which I have a different upper for this gun that actually has a bushing barrel in it, there's actually a bushing that fits on the front that holds that barrel in place in the front of the slide. Oh. So um, that requires significantly less hand fitting. But hmm. a bull barrel has a ton of fitting, both in the slide frame fit when you're initially getting this part put together, and right. then also in the barrel as it locks up. That and is the that is the most notable thing I f- see every time I pick up somebody's custom 2011 is you go to pull the slide back and it's like glass. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and then the next one is the trigger. Okay. So mm-hmm. the actual hooks of the hammer and the sear as they slide over each other, how much engagement do they have? How square are they to each other? How polished they are? So when they come apart. Oh, okay. okay. So, I mean, there's no... You know, if if you were if you were to come up to one of these in the store, if if I was a serious buyer, and I walked up to the the counter and I was like, I'm interested in buying this pistol, and they wouldn't let me pull the trigger, I wouldn't buy it. You know, hmm. like that's that's easily half of what you're paying for is is the 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 relationship of the hammer to the sear and how they were put together. Does that actually well. happen? Yeah, there are there are some gun stores. They'll be uh, they have the hammer down and then they zip tie it shut. And they're they're preserving their investment, right? Because that store sure. bought that gun too. But like you know, they don't let anybody just pull the trigger. But like, there's some stores where like you know they won't let you. But a serious buyer, that's what they're going to want to do. They're going to want to feel. They're going to want to dry fire the gun in the store, which is sacrilege to some people. But they're going to want to dry fire the gun. It's not going to hurt it at all. But that's what they they want to feel. They want to feel slide to frame, mm-hmm. and they want to feel the trigger. Yeah. And the rest is just pretty. Hmm. So we're talking a little bit about you know just routine maintenance replacing springs things like that you guys are sending a lot of rounds down range and you hear when people are talking about rifles like oh man that's you know that's a you know super hot cartridge that you're mm-hmm. running like you know you're gonna burn out your barrel in 500 rounds don't oh, get yeah. down this one are you guys replacing barrels occasionally as well I haven't hit that point yet. <laughs> not not in the Which, game that we play. There are because some. because power isn't as important, so we're shooting pretty mellow pistol cartridges. Yeah, there and are, by doing and by doing so, just it's like the there, longevity of the barrel. There's is, not enough heat and friction, yeah. and it's just not. Sometimes clean the copper out, but yeah, yeah, okay. There's, um, but uh, in, oh, then we're getting into cleaning guns. In yeah. in the pistol yeah, specific PS. game, though, in open where they're trying to make major power factor. Well, even in limited too, where they're trying to make major power factor. So now they have a cartridge that's pushing a certain amount of energy. Mm-hmm. Those can erode barrels, but that's on the tune of like getting up into the 50, 50, 60, 000 rounds. rounds <laughs> you know, that's but that's but, an interesting question though because. When when Adam mentioned major power factor, mm-hmm. um, power factor, don't quote me on this. Power factor, I think, is grain weight times velocity divided by a thousand. Is that what it is? Or divided by a hundred? It's a number, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's an so arbitrary number. It's an arbitrary number that just gives you an idea of how mm-hmm. how much recoil this gun is going to have, right? So uh, major is one eight sixty five. One sixty five. Yeah. So one sixty five is major. Minor power factor is one twenty five. And so most of what I shoot in competition for three gun is actually sub minor power factor. So it's like gotcha. 110, 115. Uh, what does that look like? That looks like a 124 grain bullet in a nine millimeter going 880 to 930, something oh, like wow. that. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh. Okay. Um, major power factor, if for the guys shooting nine millimeter, they're actually running usually what's a compressed load. So it's they fill that case with powder and then put the bullet on top of it and then press the bullet down in and it's compressing that powder in. Oh, wow. Um, that's 
uh, upwards. Uh, guys will run a 124 grain hollow point uh, upwards of 1350 to 1400 okay. feet mm-hmm. per second. So now that gun is generating a lot more heat, a lot more. Um, the slide cycles a lot faster. The mm-hmm. rearward uh, energy on that slide um, is, you know, the velocity is very high. Um, and also you're looking at uh, a lot more pressure in the in the barrel for ga- uh, a lot of gas. Mm-hmm. So they're having these big compensators on the end of the gun. And yeah. All that gas is then actuating that comp, causing it to keep that barrel down. Okay. So when you look at a uh, compensated gun like Adam's there on the end or mine here, um, these are the ports in the top. Adam's got a single port comp, uh, kind of a sight block type barrel. Um these compensators are relatively small compared to what, like, a major power factor open class IPSC or three-gun pistol would be. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're able to keep, because this, the lighter mass on the slide, the shorter slide, um, shorter barrel, uh, island barrel, stuff like that, we're able to run lower power loads and have a smaller comp, which still will keep the barrel flat, but... Uh, those major power factor nine or thirty eight super comp guns are they're smoking hot. Like you can see it, a jet of gas shoots up twenty feet from the end of that pistol. Yep. Jeez, like Sammy specification on nine millimeter is X, whatever it is for how much pressure it can make and things like that. And then you commonly see in stores plus P ammunition, so yep. that's mm-hmm. high pressure carry ammo for load. You know, and then there's even agencies that wanted plus P plus. So as Sammy said, okay, well that can be at this level. Most nine major loads are in excess of plus P plus Sammy specifications. This reminds me of those really complicated classes where you would you there's like pass fail, but there was also like pass plus and then like pass but not really and then fail minus. That's the thing. I didn't have those. I had one of those. Pass fails, pass fail, bro. It was pass, yeah, exactly. That's what I said too. But it was like, you oh, guys you, you, got, you could pass, you could pass plus. We had the letters. Uh, yeah, letter, oh, letters are pretty, <laughs> pretty easy. Hey, uh, here's a question for you guys regarding 2011s. What if you got small hands? Uh, you are you out of 2011s or or what? Hmm, I don't think so. They I make here's the different thing. size grips. Here's the thing. I don't have the biggest of hands. I'll be the first to admit. I'm like the Burger King guy who has small hands. Uh. It's hard for me to get to that slide release. How do you get to that slide release without? Oh, and when you're all, oh. it's like I can't reach the, it. The slide without, release. Oh, yeah, we don't really use those. Most of them are not active on these guns. Yeah. They're, They're just for show. Down. Yeah, it's like one well, of those it holds old, the gun uh, together. It's like one of those. It old holds the gun together. Hot it has a trucks pin that has the plastic, you know, parts on it. That you it has you a pin that goes through the barrel link. In that the doesn't bottom. sound that important. So why aren't you using it? Because are you just mostly like you know doing? That with your hand. Uh, yeah. You, ideally, you never run that gun to empty. Yeah. Well, and back to that ideally, magazine. Ideally, you change a mag before it ever locks back. Yeah, you How don't do want to run out of ammo. Huh? How you, do you do that? You plan ahead. You, sta- you stage plan. If you have 10 targets oh, and you have to shoot on. each Shotgun one twice. Shotgun was supposed to be the only one where you have to count rounds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a, standing, a flat-footed standing this. reload takes you know uh, any in anywhere from two to three to four seconds extra on your time. and it's <sighs> So if you had 10 targets and you have to shoot each one twice, 10 paper targets, and you have a 22-round magazine, as soon as I shoot that second makeup shot on a target where I felt like I don't think I hit that one twice, so I take another makeup shot, as soon as I hit that second makeup shot, I automatically think in my head, okay, I'm going to have to do a reload that I wasn't planning so that this gun doesn't lock back like this, Mm -hmm. and then I have to stop while I'm on the clock, insert another magazine, and let that thing go forward. So I don't, we don't, this slide stop is... So you're essentially just planning for a reload and removing the move forward part. And yeah, my magazine's actually, they're they're sitting over there. They don't actually even hold the slide back when it it (laughs) runs out. (laughs) It's just click. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, they cut that part out because back to the fragile nature of those magazines, a common issue in some of these is you can get false locks. Yeah. So it'll oh. it'll lock the slide stop will activate before the magazine is empty. Yep. So you were planning on using twenty rounds, and at eighteen it locked open. Interesting. Um. So to mm. mitigate that, they file off. The, there's a little tab inside that your mm-hmm. magazine catches on uh, that locks it open. They file that tab off. It's on the then, follower, right? Yep. And then they follow file that part of the follower off, so it doesn't do that. And then the other thing too is 
if your slide locks open and you drive that magazine in there, you can over insert it. Okay. And then what that would do is the back of your magazine is going to run into the ejector on the pistol and it's actually going to like break your gun if you if you slam it hard enough because it's a dainty part. So instead of hitting the bottom of your slide, which is tool steel, it, you're hitting your your little ejector, which is just pinned into the frame. Oh, okay. So, yep. so that was another concern too, is you didn't want to didn't want to. What about on ejector. the what about on the duty grade twenty elevens? Duty grade ones, they do lock open. Um, they but, it takes takes a little bit of tuning, but yeah, they they do they do set them up that way, but it just takes a little bit more. Yeah. Um, they 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 set the part. They set them up to do that. Okay. Specifically. So if you have small hands, just just think ahead, and then you won't ever have to mess yep. with the slide lock. But, yeah, I mean, but they it, also but make different size grips too. They make yeah. That, so know. the size of your hands, I have small. Like hands. I can fit like when I'm actually holding it and then pulling the trigger, it feels good. But I always thought it was like when I tried to manipulate the other stuff. Maybe I just have a short yep. thumb. I don't know. Uh, yeah. But um, I also I also think with small grip. hands, you leave. So essentially, if I had a big hand, my my hands would wrap around this far, right? Yep. So if you have small hands, your your fingers only wrap around this much. Yeah. That just leaves more of the grip open in my mind for the palm of your hand to get down there. So you get, you get, yeah. So you get better surface contact on the pistol with small hands than someone with big hands. Hmm. And if you have big hands, then you're just, then you're just double wrapped. So you're like, it's like, you know, uh, horse jockeys. You want the small guy. Yeah. Yep. Small hands, better hands. Good guys do win once in a while. Good guys do win once in a while. The 2011 is the number one pistol chosen by horse jockeys. (laughs) (laughs) Fun fact. That's that's what I learned. (laughs) Good to know. What do you say we get into last calls because we just hit an hour here? Let's do it. Does that sound good? Um, my last call, uh, huh, I'm going to go back to a, an old trick I used to use. It's a question. Oh. What's the current hotness in 2011? Uh, 2011. You said at one point making the gun heavy up front, heavy slide <sighs> was the new was the hotness. Um, is it optics? Is it these island barrels? Is it is it calibers well, that change? What's well, the new hotness? There, there's... Oh man, that as is different sports, right? 20, as of twenty nineteen, in like August September time. Okay, frame. so if we're talking about shooting like USPSA, like practical shooting, something like this is still relevant, right? Something with a full length dust cover and a lot of weight out front and a bull barrel. If you're shooting uh, limited, trying to make major power factor, you want some weight up front. Okay. Um, that world still exists, and not a lot in my mind has changed over there. They're kind of still operating. On, I mean, the rules are still the same. Yeah. They're, they're still yep. literally every year they amend the uh, acceptable pistols for production based on whatever new polymer pistol came out that year. Mm-hmm. But there's there's not a ton that changes in uh, like USPSA or IPSC practical shooting for pistol in limited or open division. There's just not a lot of changes. Carry optics was a big one. Um, but if we were talking about like multi guns, uh, like you, uh, three gun UML, any, anything like that, uh, there is, you know, I don't know, there's definitely a trend to going to an upper that has, uh, reduced mass, uh, a slide that has reduced mass, um, you know, not even necessarily more weight up front, but you'll look at like Adam's pistol, my pistol for open here. We're actually running, uh, a dot on the slide that's reciprocating, um, and then if you look at like a limited or like a, a tactical division, um, like Atlas Hyperion, yep. uh, there's, you know, the DVC three gun, um, those guns are, they're actually reducing mass on the slide. Um, and they're trying to hit a very specific mass. Yeah. That's one of the things that attracted me to Atlas Gunworks is like, there's a lot of companies they'll, they'll cut whatever fun design you want on the slide, but, um, they are actually going for a very specific weight. Gotcha. On here. Okay. So there's only certain cuts that they'll do because they're trying to hit their sp- specific weight. Which they've deemed is best for yep. mitigating or, or at least yep. making it a comfortable recoil yep. impulse. Uh, are I, they also picking places on the slide mm-hmm. strategically yep. to remove yep. that weight? Not, yep. like not this, just to hit this that cut number. right here is yeah, pretty, pretty is characteristic a, of them. I thought it was like an optic cut, but it's way yep. too small. But it's like just Infinity just doesn't scallop. do that. So. There's a lot of good companies out there. I... Um, I run uh, basically a haze worked over pistol, um, and they're making pistols very specifically for three gun, just like yep. the Atlas yeah. Hyperion, yep. just like um, STI DVC three gun, and you know that's a specific sport. And so, 
within kind of what you asked, I think there's kind of going to less mass on the slide, trying to less reciprocating. Um, and in open division, there's a big movement towards these slide mounted dots. Okay. Because you can use any holster. You don't have to have a big frame on the side of the gun for your optic. Right. Oh, sure. Which yeah. makes you use a, a race holster. Gotcha. That's the new hotness. Mark, what you got? Well, Jim, I'll see your last call question, and I will raise you three last call questions. <laughs> Boom. Is it really last call, then? Coming. Uh, it's last ask. So I just want to make sure <laughs> I got this straight. So I'm going to and I'm gonna go, the big advantages of going with a 2011, we've got uh, the grip angle, we've got the trigger, and essentially the overall precision and fit and finish of all these parts working together essentially Lo- locomotion the, locomotion yeah. just yeah just to a higher degree of precision and affecting your overall shooting experience and making you a faster more efficient shooter yep plus the capacity and the capacity i wrote that i wrote that right. down too okay. well like here's the deal like if you're if you're currently in you know polymer land like in your your 2011 curious and you're out on the range if you see one that looks cool just go up and ask that guy to shoot it like hey, let Mark finish his thing. He might not. Yeah. He might well, not. That's, well, no, that's a good. Yeah, that's, that's a good you know, thing. I don't know a single one of these guys that Man, I. I mean, Rube. I've sold hundreds of these things. Man. I don't know a single guy who wouldn't let you shoot his gun and tell you everything about it. Oh, you know, yeah. that's yeah. usually that's, pretty proud. Honestly, that's what I'm worried about. I want to shoot the gun, but then. Come on, Mark. Yeah. You make friends with everybody that's, on that's that. That's You make friends with everybody waterfowling who has a dog. So why can't you just make friends with everybody on the range as a 2011? I was, yeah. You're right. I it's like a dog, but it shoots, and it's yep. way more spiky. Yep. I was trying to, like, act cool and mysterious, but I actually do want but, to talk to these people. But once you shoot it, then you'll get it. Like, that's when we shot our first 2011s. We're like, oh, oh, I need that. <laughs> no, can you stop? Because that was going to be my last call. All right. Mark, Sorry. Okay. Ask more questions. Is there any crossover with some of these things into, well, not that you couldn't, use this as a carry gun because you could, right? I do. But are any of these things maybe crossing over into like slightly smaller, more compact guns? Mm-hmm. Yep, mm-hmm. yep. A lot of these companies also make the similar guns in smaller sizes. What do you okay. call those, like 2010s? or <laughs> Commander length uh, or yeah. smaller. Yep. Um, yeah. All right. Yep. Three and a half, four inch barrels. And then they use, you know, they're smaller on the grips too. Um, they're shorter. So they have smaller grip capacity, but yes, there are there are carry guns like this too. Cool. And then my third is we got a lot of representative samples here. Which one? Which one is like your go-to favorite? And is and is it the last one because you have all these this experience along the way, and then you're like, yep, I've picked the perfect pistol at least for right now until I make X change. Yeah, I feel like. I feel like my shooting career always kind of takes these little turns, so I like want something slightly different. But I would say these these two are probably the last that I would ever need. Those are the most recent ones that you have. Yep. The- yep. I shot I shot this one in, in TAC and Limited um, when I was on the Pro Series, and then I wanted to try the open thing. So to get an open gun, I needed one that would take a dot. Okay. So um, current favorite or current one that I shoot the most um, because I'm shooting open division in in three gun. Current favorite is still this one. This one's still. So one's are those both Atlas? These are both made by Atlas Gunworks. One of them has a one. The one with the dot on it has the comp on it. Yep. The Viper red dot. It's got. This is an early scalping. edition of what became the Erebus model. Okay. And then um, this one, they would call this one a custom, but it, it's essentially it's essentially their their Titan or their their standard five inch limited gun. Okay. So, cool. but two favorites. Okay. The rest is just for funsies. Good job, Mark. That's what I got. All right, you guys are up for last calls. Hopefully you can uh, change the momentum here back to last calls instead of last asks. <laughs> 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 uh, my deal on these is, like, especially when you're talking about the custom guns, there's so many options, and people get so far down into the weeds on stuff that probably really doesn't even matter. Um, we've done we've done episodes on other shows um, where we kind of break down some of this, but, like, don't worry about or, about the specifics too much or if you are you know find find a good person uh, either at some of these companies that can help you or um, you know ask around some of the Facebook groups we can talk you through a lot of what the different options are just understanding that it's it's small potatoes but um, 
don't be afraid of a custom gun or that you're going to pick the wrong thing, you know, and let that keep you out of, out of the game. Like it's just, just walk through and there's plenty of people who will help you through the process. Uh, me being one of them, you can send me, I love talking about these. So you can send me emails all you want, but, um, just, just ask if it's intimidating. Cause really the, it's just small details that should be afraid of. Noted. I think my last call is that when, when you see and you talk about, um, getting into a, a pistol, whether it be a 2011 or uh, a really nice CZ or a Tanfo or something like that, uh, these competition-made, competition-focused pistols. Uh, a lot of times people sp- look at a price point and they think that they don't need, I don't need that, right? Like I don't need to spend that because this works just as good. That's usually the, the excuse that people make when they're thinking about buying something like this. And I think most of the time people don't realize that it's not apples to apples. Um, you're not, this isn't, this at $4,000 isn't performing at the same level as this at $600. Um, it's, it's not, it's, it's completely at a different level of performance. So it's just like if you stood 10 feet away from an AMG 6-24 to and a, and a Diamondback Tactical 6-24, to 10 feet away, they look identical. Mm-hmm. They're, they're almost indistinguishable from that distance away. When you look through it, you use it, and you actually get out, put it on a gun, take it out on a hunt or on a competition, that's where you see some of those uh, additional benefits of higher quality components or uh, more attention to um, design specifications or uh, tolerances when uh, during assembly, right? So that if, if you truly don't think, my here's my last call, if you don't think you need one, then... Um, then maybe you, maybe you don't, but don't, uh, don't knock it till you tried it, get behind one and shoot it because you'll see that, okay, this isn't a $6,000 version of this. This is completely different. Hmm. This might be some of the most money we've spent on guns, like raw purchase, but price per round. These are the cheapest guns we own. Yeah. This is the cheapest gun I own. If you look at per round. Yeah. (laughs) Most most uh, expensive. Okay, per, fair enough. Per I round see what you're is saying. probably your carry gun. Yep, yep. I just got really confused. Okay, so this gun at uh, yes, four thousand dollars. Yes, right? um, I have between this upper and the other upper on this gun, I have almost seventy thousand rounds. So okay. divide the price of this gun by seventy thousand. And then per now shot, oh, I get it. Yeah, per shot, divide the, shot, now, divide the six fifty of this gun by the f- two hundred rounds you've put through it. Pretty expensive. Well, first off, this isn't my gun. Second off, <laughs> <laughs> second it, off, what were you looking at? Second off, it may have. Yeah, how did you know that? These are these are things I know. I just looked at it. I, it was, that was yeah. insane. He just, um. Adam has superpowers. All right. Thanks, everybody, uh, <laughs> for listening. If you have any other questions about 2011s, fancy guns, whatever else, you know, tank foes, CZs, or just even polymer guns, which we like, too, hit us up. Always happy to talk about guns. Um, happy hunting and shooting, everybody. I feel like I'm supposed to say something else, but I, uh, I'm not. So, bye. 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 Thanks, gents. Thank you. I think you convinced me. Yeah? I'm not going to get one. You're all in? I'm not going to get one because I already don't shoot my Glock enough. <laughs> but, and that's not mine. It's <laughs> not my Glock. It's Jameson. Oh, then I overestimated. Yes. You oh, you, you can tell uh, wear marks on the breech face and the feed ramp. God, that is smooth. Instantly go from podcasting and everybody's just like fingering all these guns over here. Why is your rear sight set so far over? We should do. Hey Ryan, is the that sound still on? Is it still recording? Hey, ever, let's do. A, let's do a symphony. Of. Should you do like jingle bells or something? <laughs> Hold on, I it's got this. It's beautiful. Oh here, yeah, there you go. I'll throw a little bit of that. <laughs> That's like uh, like some mix master yeah. stuff right there. Wicket, wicket, wicket. Hitting him with the high F. <laughs> 
All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.